ki te tangi e te manue karanga nei tui, 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 tui. Tui e irunga, tui e raro, tui e roto, tui e waho, tui e hera tangata. Uh, listen to the cry of the bird calling, unite, unite, be one. United above, bound below, tied together within and without, bring all the people together. Ena mana, ena reo, ala rakatera ma, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, ko Richard Blakey, tōko ingoa, he kamahi aha te wharewānanga o otako, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora everyone, I'm Richard Blakey, I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research at the Enterprise at the University of Otago. It's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you here to the first ceremonial part of our afternoon, uh, celebrating the Christchurch Heart Institute. And um, uh, we and others of the official party uh, very, look forward very much to um, the lectures that we're able to attend. We apologise now that we have to, at various times, slip out a little bit early, but we wish you well for the afternoon. So um, firstly, acknowledgements. Uh, 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 ko um, tumuaki at Te Whareuananga o Otago, Carleen, uh, Tenakwe, uh, to our leaders in the Division of Health Sciences in the Otago Medical School, Tena Rua, to our Dean, uh, Tena Kwe, uh, to Te Rupu or to Christchurch Heart Institute, uh, Tena Koto, uh, to members of the public, family and supporters of the University of Otago and Christchurch, uh, of um, aspects to do with heart disease or other members who are here for the pure interest and joy of hearing about uh, advanced research out of the University of Otago, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, uh, tēnā rā kato katoa. Um, I'm just going to say a few words by introduction to outline the reason that we are joining here to recognise the Christchurch Art Institute as the recipients of the University of Otago's 2020 Research Group Awards. We've heard today uh, in our celebration of the Distinguished Research Medal from uh, Professor Murdoch for those that were able to attend that research uh, is a team sport inherently. I think that was one of the key messages, although it wasn't particularly the words that you used, um, in which the influences and, act and uh, drive of individuals is important, but the achievement is generally um, the result of a huge collective effort. And so the University of Otago has recognised this um, for the last five or six years with <clears throat> the establishment of the uh, research Group Award. It is much more difficult to uh, define criteria for what the achievements of a group should be, how they should be recognised, what defines a group, rather than just a natural form of collaboration. Uh, but we have gone about that, <clears throat> and uh, many of the requirements for the Group Award reflect the requirements of individual achievement, of outstanding scholarly achievement. But in this case, it's got to un enhance understanding development and well-being of the individuals in society. So when we get together collectively as a research group, it's very much more often the case that it's not to drive fundamental knowledge and understanding. That is very critical. Sometimes that does require good group effort. But it is really to drive to impact. A strong eye to impact is much more what is needed to be the recipients of the University of Otago Group Award. And we can identify that uh, for example, one of the other past recipient groups has been the group from the Dunedin Multidisciplinary Health and Development Research Study that has, over many, many years, over 40 years plus, contributed alongside the Christchurch cohort that um, is a, another one of the Taonga from University of Otago, contributed to those knowledges and understanding for well-being of people. And um, so we call for applications every year in about February, March, and we, we receive an interesting cohort. And this year, the standout nomination was from the Christchurch Heart Institute. And many of you, as you will see today, will see over many, many years, over, over um, about 40 years or so, that long-standing heritage of achievement, that whakapapa that has come through, uh, that makes it quite clear and obvious. However, when we define the criteria, we um, make it a little bit harder for the nominators. We, we say that whilst we can recognise long history and heritage of achievement, um, you cannot just rest on laurels and say we did wonderful work a long time ago, so please recognise us now. The real work, the real assessment is on work that has been undertaken during the last five years. So that's why I particularly like your programme, that you recognise those that came before and the the, the heritage of the Christchurch Heart Institute. But the panel that um, made this 
uh, recommendation to the Vice-Chancellor for this award, um, could not formally recognise that. They recognised that through that there was a great deal of leadership and capability development, but it was really the achievements over the last five years that, that is the genesis, is the, is the um, at the core of, of this award. <clears throat> and so we have um, an afternoon's uh, program that has um, at its conclusion some of the uh, future leaders, current and future leaders presenting. Um, and um, I, I am drawn to just a couple of final reflections uh, before I ask um, Professor Murdoch to introduce the Christchurch Heart Institute, that that impact sheets home in, um, in health and biomedical sciences to us in a very personal way very often. And in fact, just over the last week, I had called to reflect on that through a very close member of our family uh, presenting in the morning with a, um, a bit of a turn that then turned into a, a visit to the, um, to the GP that then turned into the, a ride in the ambulance to an afternoon in hospital uh, uh, being uh, subjected to a, a range of tests that I'm sure included proponent and BNP and a number of other things that the Christchurch Heart Institute has led directly to, which fortunately led to the, uh, the uh, pleasant outcome of you have got an interesting heart rhythm, but we don't think that you've suffered a, a, a critical cardiac event. So uh, we all have elements in our life with people that are close to us who have been affected positively by this. And I leave, I leave with a statement that we had from um, Professor Mark Richards in our Heikitenga Global when talking about the global impact of research, that when you consider that there might be 25 million people in the world with heart failure facing 20 to 25 percent annual mortality. That's more than a million fewer lives lost annually should our findings be applied worldwide. So that is the level of achievement that we are recognising here uh, with the award of the University's uh, Research Group Award to the Christchurch Heart Institute. So please, on behalf of the University, let's um, firstly congratulate that group for this award as I invite Professor David Murdoch to uh, talk a little bit about their achievements. Tēnā koutou katoa. Tēnā koutou katoa. And <clears throat> um, not surprisingly, I'm, I'm losing my voice. Um, Tēnā koutou katoa, and I, I was about to say, for those who don't know me, I think I know most people, but um, I'm David Murdoch, the Dean and Head of Campus, University of Otago, Christchurch, and really great pleasure to uh, introduce the Christchurch Heart Institute, and I promise I'll keep it brief, even if just to keep my voice uh, intact. Um, really, uh, it really does give me great pleasure. I think anyone who's been um, in Christchurch any time know that this group is really... The, a cornerstone of health research in the city, both on this campus and beyond. And it really uh, would be unusual to think about health research without thinking of the Christchurch Heart Institute. And I must admit, I feel like I've grown, I've matured with the group in a way without actually being a member. And I mean, I can go back and remember as a medical student under Eric Espiner and Gary Nichols. And in fact, I was your house surgeon as well in the World War B3 quite a long time ago. And I'm, I'm sure that I probably took part in some of those studies at the time, which seemed to happen during ward rounds. <laughs> yeah, Gary's nodding here. I think we would often be uh, taken aside and have uh, some blood tests taken during, during the day. And um, I can't remember many details about the studies beyond that. And I was Mark Richards' registrar at one stage, and uh, I actually recall uh, Mark's acumen in infectious diseases because he actually diagnosed me with glandular fever, which I don't think you probably remember. <laughs> I was unwell and he insisted I was tested and made a correct diagnosis. But that was, that was some time ago. But the, the group is certainly notable for many things. And I think for me it's, it's been the bringing along a succession of really bright young talent and taking them through to maturity and to leadership positions within the group, and that seems to have happened throughout the journey. Um, and then work that really crosses both the lab and the clinical in a, in a great way. Um, 
and in terms of both fundamental science and diagnostic science, in addition to the, the, the clinical aspects in a way I've, I've very rarely seen and done in a, in systematically and connected and relevant and with a, a clear focus on doing clinically relevant, impactful research. Uh, and uh, I've only seen, it when I, since I've been Dean, only seen more visibility of that and, and really that impressive focus on, on the best of all science. So really it's, it's with absolutely great pleasure that I introduce the group and, and to say that I'm a very proud Dean to know that you've received this award because it's absolutely deserved. So I will um, hand over to Mark, but congratulations to the group on a well-deserved award. Kia ora. It has to be all downhill after that, I think, really. Um, but we'll do our best. So just to remind you, uh, if you're not familiar with us, we're about 50 people. We divide in, naturally into four disciplines and we work together. And that's been the key to our success, such as it is, that we do get along and we do uh, work off each other's strengths. We are hosts of within uh, the University of Otago Christchurch and we're closely linked with clinical departments. And we have a lot of external connections as well, which I won't take up time with at the moment. And we take as our brief um, freedom to examine anything to do with cardiovascular risk and disease. And you can divide that into stages A to D. And A, you might just be carrying something, like a bit of high blood pressure, but you're perfectly well. By the time you get through to D, you really should be writing your will and talking to your friends. And we take permission to investigate each point of this cascade. And biomarkers and the things that we uh, have taken time getting involved with play a role, particularly at the sharp end of disease, but progressively it's obvious that measuring markers earlier and earlier in the stages of pre-morbid states where risk is present but disease is not yet present uh, offers value uh, clinically. So we're trying to move, we're trying to keep our place at the sharp end but spread our canvas right into the community. And the story for me, but not for those senior to me, began at Princess Margaret Hospital in 1983, where we had endocrinology and cardiology and respiratory medicine all based there for, for, uh, for the Christchurch Health Board. And this man, Hamid Ikram, Professor Hamid Ikram, who is with us today, was uh, a very cardinal part of this whole deal. Hamid brought Christchurch screaming and struggling into the 20th century with respect to cardiology and introduced things like left heart catheterization, much to the horror and trepidation of many of our even more senior colleagues, but he made cardiology in Christchurch what it is today. Now, you might recognize a couple of people here. You know, um, 37 years. I don't think I could grow a mustache like that anymore. <laughs> I think the ratio of spectacle lens to facial surface area was, there was the competition of the time. And I still wore a white coat and a tie, both of which are quite ill-advised, really, from a microbiological point of view, I'm sure David would agree. And this is Eric, who's so old-fashioned, he's now in again uh, with, <laughs> with, with, with his facial hair. And we had a project, and the project was to measure contemporaneously systemic arterial pressure by an ambulatory device, and also pulmonary arterial pressure, which involves putting a catheter through a vein, through the right heart, into the pulmonary artery, and then getting people to get up and walk around. Now, this was not my idea. This was Gary Nichols and Hammond, or Gammon and Harry, as we used to call them sometimes, actually conspiring. They thought this was a good thing to do, and I was really completely unaware that logistically and technically this is almost impossible, so we did it. And, and a lot of what's happened since then has been a bit like that. Um, so we had uh, people to help us. Tom Tanner's a technician, most won't remember. Lisa Brabant was a technical person in the lab. Well, I was struck by the fact that they would always line up to have these things done, and Kiwis are characterised by participation. They take part in research, they seldom say no, and that is in sharp contrast to other places where I have worked. There's also expertise in the background, so long before I have arrived, um, Gary was well known in the field of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system in that domain. And I, we had a conversation on one occasion in which I said, um, 
uh, you know, the natural peptides are really important. You can't live without them. Tiny shifts actually alter your physiology. And he said to me, well, I thought the world revolved around the renal angiotensin system. So we came to a compromise. And this book is, is still the Bible, really, I think, of renal angiotensin system original work and, and, uh, and data. So the place was set up uh, with expertise, if you like. This is a 1984 picture of Hamid and, and Gary looking pretty frisky in Geneva, the first ever international conference I ever went to, the International Society of Hypertension. Uh, this is Gary just a few days ago, and this is uh, Hamid about three years back uh, when he got his, his birthday honours. And I think these three people can take the credit for what's become of us all because the cardiologist Hamid Ikram and the endocrinologist Eric Espin are both master clinicians glued together by a cardiovascular endocrinologist with a kind of gluing together tendency. Really it's the conversation between these three people that made what was first the cardioendocrine research group and latterly became the Christchurch Heart Institute, made it possible and creative in the way that, that it is and has, has remained. So there are a lot of things we could talk about. We've really delved into about 20 different biological systems over time, but I'll just focus on the one that we seem to be best known for, which is the cardiac natriuretic peptides. And our fortune favours the prepared mind. And it turned out that long before AMP and BMP actually were discovered, uh, Gary was waiting for them to arrive. So he had a hypothesis, which he published in The Lancet in the days when I think you could publish hypotheses in The Lancet. I'm not sure you can anymore. But the bottom line there was that there seemed to be the need for something else to balance salt and water in the body, and there was likely to be a natriuretic hormone which augments electrolyte excretion. And sure enough, there was some uh, electron microscopy data. These granules appear in atrial cells of mammals, and they get bigger and smaller and darker and lighter depending upon the volume and salt status of the animal. And then Adolfo de Bold, a Chilean man working in Ontario, uh, took the simple step of grinding up atria, making an extract and injecting it into rats and produced this tremendous surge in sodium excretion. And not long after that, the actual active element was identified, atrial natriuretic peptide. We got hold of some, or I think it was Gary who got hold of it, probably from Bristol-Myers Squibb, and we injected it into ourselves. And lo and behold, um, actually, People are just like rats. They have this big spike in sodium if you give them enough AMP. The dose of AMP was 100 micrograms. We hadn't figured out how to measure AMP by that stage. We didn't realise we were giving ourselves what was actually a, a sledgehammer blow of peptide to completely pharmacological and non-physiological levels. But we were pleased that we produced <laughs> a result like this. And actually, all of the guinea pigs were all of the authors. So it was actually a pretty, pretty good outcome all around. And actually, we are all still around, which is... <laughs> after 37 years, not to be taken for granted. Um, and then we got a little more sophisticated and found that very subtle increments in AMP infused could produce very readily detectable changes in salt balance and blood pressure and renin levels. And this is a paper that was penned by Eric uh, and published in Lancet a, a year or two later. And then um, we decided there might be clinical applications. We were really interested in the biology. That's what really got us into it in the first place. But the clinical applications really started to cohere or coalesce uh, when Eric got together with uh, Mark Davis, who is with us today, and uh, said this might be a diagnostic. And, and indeed turned out to be true that a BNP of a certain threshold was a very sensitive test and quite specific for identifying acute heart failure amongst people who were turning up to the emergency department with shortness of breath. Mark's with us, uh, now working in the Waikato. Eric's still with us, still generating new data on new projects. Um, so this led on later to discovery of NT Pro BNP, which is really a very much a Christchurch and University of Otago discovery. It was theorised that it should exist. Tim Yandel in particular believed it should be present and went out of his way to then go and prove that it was. And this very simple table in this humble journal really doesn't really need statistics. You can see that in normal people, NT pro BNP is a long way lower than in heart failure. You don't even need to draw a graph to see that, and the p-value clearly has a very large number of zeros in front of it. And that assay was set up using radioimmunoassay systems uh, and uh, led by Tim. 
And I've put them together here with a rather dashing Chris Charles. <laughs> but I've, I've picked this picture because it's the typical Tim Yandall expression. He's got his head turned to one side. He's looking at you out of the side of his eyes. He's smiling. I mean you no harm, but you will have to prove that before I really believe what you're saying to me. <laughs> And he's been succeeded uh, by Chris, who has discovered new galaxies of potential markers that people dogmatically didn't believe could possibly exist, the signal peptides in particular. And uh, you'll hear more from uh, some of these folk later in the afternoon, but these people have generated, Chris, Tim, and those that work with them, the team in the lab that have worked with them, have generated original assays numbering 20 or 30 over the last 30 or so years and validated them often before anybody else in the world has done so. And this is our star marker, NT Pro BNP. It's derived from Pro BNP. And we found um, that it was useful. After all was said and done, looking at quite large numbers of people coming through the emergency department, if you are short of breath and you do have NT Pro BNP above certain levels, it's a sensitive and specific test for heart failure. And it's hard to remember now how salutary that was. There was no blood test for heart failure. It was entirely clinical, and the error rate was roughly 50%. Usually, fortunately, in the direction of overdiagnosis rather than underdiagnosis. But you know, the test has made a huge amount of improvement globally around the world. And it's a test which is used literally hundreds of thousands of times uh, per year in every uh, most centres. And aside from being diagnostic, it told us a little bit about the future. So this is a bunch of people with heart attacks, over 600 people with myocardial infarctions. We found that if you were above a certain threshold, your risks over the next 120 days after your heart attack were considerably worse than if you had a lower level of NT pro BNP. And this is all dependent upon participation by very many patients. This is a slide put together by Vicky, who clearly has more artistic talent than I do. But it, each circle represents a cohort if you add up all these numbers, that equates to something like 13,000 people that have participated in CHI studies over time, and some of them are still uh, contributing data even now. I'd like to say <coughs> a word about these young chaps. This is in the 90s sometime or other. Um, I'd particularly like to acknowledge Richard, who has been a 2IC and a clinical leader, uh, particularly over the last decade or more, holding things together for our clinical studies uh, in a skilled and humble fashion. I'd also like to acknowledge the fact that we have collaborators up and down the country. Rob Doughty, I think, still with us in the room, has to leave early. He's still here. So we have a cohort study. This is one of several that have operated between Auckland and, and Christchurch, between Auckland University and University of Otago. This is the, was originally the acute coronary syndrome study, and then I decided I was really interested in chronic events, so I changed its name. Not a good idea. Don't do that. Just find a, a nice acronym and stick with it. However, over a number of years, we recruited over 2,000 people, and they have been yielding a lot of data. These are data that were put together by Phil Adamson, one of our more recent arrivals in the group, and obviously had a greater artistic sense than I've ever had at putting data together. And these are troponin levels, both early and then at later stages after a coronary event. And you can see that some of them remain high right out at to several months later, even though this is a test which is supposed to be used as an acute on the day at the time test it really is looking abnormal for a very long period in what are mainly stable patients. And that actually runs alongside outcome. So if you have a heart attack and your troponin stays up, your likelihood of striking a fatal event over the ensuing years is clearly much greater than if that does not happen. And that fact and similar data related to NT Pro BMP are being used by Rob at the moment to lead a national study adding in markers at the months after a coronary event to see if you can improve outcome by being guided by that. We're linked with genetics and epigenetics, and I think Vicky's now, uh, group is now called the Omics Group. Um, this is uh, Vicky at an earlier and slightly later stages in uh, the CHI trajectory. I think before and after birthday honours, I think, Vicky, and um, some of our graduates and what happened there is we combined genotyping with markers, and this is one example uh, published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology, whereby you could find that a particular insertion deletion uh, change in the ACE angiotensin converting gene, coupled with measurement of BNP, could give you an idea about outcomes also post myocardial infarction. And that's one of very many genetic studies and genomic typing studies that Vicky and Anna have led uh, since then. 
These cohorts, when they're well planned and well annotated and deeply detailed, just keep on giving and giving. And the most recent example is the one on the right-hand side of the page there, which is published in circulation, a co-top ranking cardiovascular journal. And it's a study done in collaboration with Singapore. We've had a lot of work together with that country in the last 10 years. And really, it looked at people that had suffered a heart attack, both in New Zealand, the CDCS cohort, and in Singapore, the Immaculate cohort, uh, did a rather sophisticated form of proteomics on them, took single cells from other models, both um, human cells and rodent cells, and looked for common factors that occurred after ischemic injury. The idea being to be who is going to evolve in an adverse fashion, who will eventually arrive at heart failure, either in the intermediate or longer term, after they have a coronary event. And we arrived at some targets, some of which were reassuringly obvious, like NT Pro BMP and troponin, but some others that are not so obvious and which we're now enjoying exploring in greater depth. So that's a 2020 contribution. Um, animals, we've depended upon animal models over time. This is Chris, who recently published a rather nice review of animal models of heart failure. This figure is derived from that. And he works alongside Miriam, who works with the sheep. And this is a model where you can pace animals in and out of heart failure, uh, which is unique. A large animal closely monitored and um, with pressure measurements in the heart and in the, in the vessels, uh, measurement of the neurohormonal status in the circulation, measurement of kidney function, and moving into failure and back out again, that's a unique uh, asset, which you'll only find in a handful of places around the world. And we've coupled this together from <laughs> omic studies. So we took kidney biopsies, serially, Suetania Palma helped us uh, as the sheep moved in and out of failure, and then ran uh, RNA-seq, or a kind of global RNA expression analysis uh, led by Anna Pilbrow, who's having one of her elfin days when this picture was taken. And she has identified genetic gene targets that may relate to kidney injury in the context of heart failure. So it's an example of cross-disciplinary partnership and also keeping up with the Joneses in terms of modern technologies. Impact, I'm near, near to the end, so don't become too anxious. <laughs> Impact, we do think, we, we do try to translate. And this is an excerpt from the 2016 European Society of Cardiology guidelines on the diagnosis and management of heart failure. And they are still extant, they still apply. And I remember when NT Pro BMP was first published back in the 90s, and people asked us, well, do you really need that? I don't need that. But things have moved along a lot since then. Um, and what it says here is, if you've got someone in front of you who you suspect might have heart failure, you should always measure an NT-Pro BNP or a BNP. And the strength of recommendation is the highest strength of recommendation with the highest class of evidence ever given in uh, universal guidelines. And this is repeated in the American guidelines and the Australasian guidelines and the UK NICE guidelines. And our fingerprints are all over that. We actually influence clinical behaviour in emergency departments all over the world every day. Second to last slide, this would not be complete without acknowledging the Heart Foundation. The Heart Foundation has supported the chair that I hold at the moment, the Chair of Cardiovascular Studies. It's also supported Rob Doughty in his own chair and that collaborative link between the two chairs. And we have done our bit, here's Vicky and myself, sitting on the Scientific Advisory Group in 2006. So this is what we looked like 14 years ago. Haven't changed a bit really, have we? And uh, these are all people that have been valuable colleagues in the process as well. Particularly Norman Sharp, warrants mention, he was leader of the group that Rob has subsequently led very ably since, um, but was always a major supporter of Christchurch cardiovascular efforts. And the Heart Foundation has provided the CHI and its predecessor um, form uh, with millions of dollars effectively over the last several decades. And finally, this is most of us, but not all of us. I think it's about 30 out of the 50 of us. Um, and this is what we looked like in August 2019, um, 30 years down the track, with some newcomers. So Phil, whom we are depending upon to lead the charge, and Chris, to continue to lead the charge. Some older, sort of you know, not so newcomers. <laughs> Lorraine, who leads our clinical coordination group, and myself. Richard, who is looking very senior and mature these days. And, and, our, and our statistician, statistician here, who also um, has been with us a very long time. 
And I'd like to apologise now because whenever anybody does this, they will miss people out and things out that are actually really important. And later this evening, I'll be kicking myself repeatedly as I remember a really important thing that Gary or Eric or somebody else in the lab did or a study that we published that warranted mention or a particular achievement, um, and I beg forgiveness for that. And thank you for your attention. We are profoundly grateful to all of the people who work with us both within the group and beyond the group, but particularly to our patients. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, before I hand over to Vicky as the MC for the, for the presentations, there is a formality to deal with in terms of the presentation of something to the Christchurch Heart Institute for the University of Otago Group Award. But I would like to invite the Vice-Chancellor to come up and also, the, I think the steering group for the Christchurch Heart Institute are going to receive on behalf of the university a token of our appreciation for your efforts in recognition of re receiving the group award.